I'm originally from Israel, and about 30 years ago, I came to the United States with the search of glory and uh, who knows what else. I really wanted to learn film and television. I went to New York University, and I was accepted from 350 people that tried to get in in 1980. Uh, only 31 were accepted. Only later on, I discovered that the three, um, the three instructors that was actually checking us out or evaluate our ability, they were Martin Scorsese, Francis Coppola, and um, Woody Allen. I did not know any of them. In the 80, none of us know any of them, right? <laughs> anyway, but that was a long story. That's a long time ago, so put this perspective. I, I went to drive a taxi. That's look, most Israelis or foreigners, and today will be Indian and Pakistanian, will do it. I went to drive a taxi in New York for six months, till eventually I had enough money and I started the company. And what I wanted to do really is involve myself uh, in the water and in underwater photography to tell the story about the ocean and what I knew about the ocean. During the time that I was driving a taxi, I was driving a taxi at night, and during the daytime I was working as a, uh, a diving guide or dive master at a dive shop in New York City. How many divers we have here? Beautiful. How many of you are photographer also? Holding a camera underwater, it doesn't make any difference what camera. That's okay. I started from there, that's okay. <laughs> that's perfectly all right. So, if I speak fast, it's only because I picked my English in New York driving a taxi. So please forgive me. If my accent is difficult, I don't believe you, because there are 30% of Silicon Valley are Israelis anyway. So you've already been in business with Israeli one time or another. So to make the long story short, what I'm here really is to be able to share with you the story and the privilege that America gave me. I was privileged, or I am a privilege perhaps, um, visited over 131 nations all around the world. And believe me, there is no country in the world like this country. No matter how difficult, no matter what the obstacles, the challenges we have, there is no country in the world and there is no constitution like we have in America. And no surprise, we reached this level. I was able to master what you're going to see now only because either the country, the substance of this country, the foundation and the people that believe in my dream and participate and join me. As a photographer, there are two ways to go about it. Either you go, you create a portfolio, you send it to so many different places to get work, or you go out and execute your own vision, my own dream. I chose the last one. I chose to work after my own dream and make it available. However, in the process, what become very clearly that institution, like magazine, television stations, and uh, network, were concerned that they were not able to get the money worth for my vision and for my dream. So I went and I did it alone, trusting that people like yourself or other in America will join me, will participate in what my dream is. Because I'm not any different than any one of you. We all have dreams. But some of you and me may have similar dreams and we can join venture. So I put my expertise in the field. You put your expertise among the pixels and all those nano technology. I put it out in the big animals. So let's go and see what I have in store for you. What you're going to see today is an ontology of years and almost 30 years of having fun, pushing the envelope, photographing on the edge of wilderness, comfort, and common sense. And I'm not saying that lightly. I desired very much to come back again. And thank you, Vivian, again for the opportunity to work with people like yourself and to share because you are on the edge of technology. Yes, you have all the comfort in the world, but you're, putting, you're pushing the envelope in what you do. And that is fascinating how we connect some of the elements in your life, some of the elements of my life, and some of the elements of somebody else and get make a better life. And the idea in my view and my presentation today is to be able to show you or to bring to your knowledge, not a specific trip, not a specific picture, but just the conglomerate issue of what the big animal, what the position they have in our culture, and what we can do, each one of ourselves, small world or big world, to protect them and to make them, to make them available for, for future generation. And that will be just a glory for the big animal. That's how I, most of the time, wearing a shirt like that is very unusual for me. I could not even put it in my pants because I'm too fat by now. I'm not in the water for a long time ago, not long, not long enough, but only that's, um, this weekend, I'm leaving for Mexico, diving with a great white for about two weeks. And that is my backyard. 
And all those places that you see here are the places where images and uh, expedition that I'll conduct or I'm conducting all around the world. So if you go sometime sooner or later uh, to my website, you'll be able to see all those places one by one as they are relating. And we'll start with the polar bear. All of you probably heard and knows what the polar bear plight and all the story about the global warming. It is indeed taking effect and we don't know what will be the next generation, the next step. However, what is important to know that the polar bear are ancestors of the grizzly and they are evolved into be polar bear only 300,000 years ago. It is not something that take like sharks that are living in the ocean 400 million years. Polar bear only evolved in the past 300,000 years ago. So there are process, the planet is on continu continuous change, continuous evolution, continuous, and we are part of it right now. But to understand how the polar bear live and to get close to that, that's what I do and that's what we bring in people, a small group. My team usually about only four people when we go to look at the polar bear and we give you a few opportunities. So you ask me how close I was to the polar bear, almost as close as I am to the front row right now. Understanding that every animal, like human being, we have a pattern of behavior, we have tools of how we protect, how we feed, how we make babies. Also, animals have the same pattern, similar pattern. And the polar bear, in this case, its pattern or its protection is the sense of smell. So if the wind goes away from the polar bear, he will not smell when we get close to it. The question is, how often I can do it? It takes a long time. You not, you not challenge the, the environment and against the environment. You just play together with the wind till it happens. So usually a trip like that may take two or three weeks, but we're able to achieve results, as you see right now. Everything is timely. Everything in the environment is about time. It's about knowing exactly when the polar bear, or in this case the animal, is on uh, uh, nurturing, when they are mating, when they're migrating, and when they are feeding. If we know, if I know all of this, that's where I take the people with me on the trip for small window of opportunity throughout the year. That's why I don't repeat the same trips, the same trip each year. There are only one trip at a kind every other month. But we'll be able to bring this kind of opportunity, this kind of images. Um, Vivian, can we ask somebody to turn some of the light down so maybe the images will be seen better? Um, I want also to take you underwater, not just topside. And I want to share with you this. Anybody knows what is that? Anybody? Yes. That's very good, Vian. Thank you. That's the blue whale. Any, what do you know about the blue whale? Anybody? Any idea? Big. How big? The biggest animal ever live on the planet. Biggest than any, um, um, any dinosaurs. How big is it, really? How long? How long? 60? 60 feet. Any other number? 100 feet long. Yes. And eat only? Plankton. There used to be about over a quarter of a million blue whales on our planet. Today, how many left? Anybody knows? Hardly 12,000. 7,000 of them in the southern hemisphere, about 5,000 on the northern hemisphere. And from the 5,000 in the northern hemisphere, about 2,500 to 3,000 along the coast of Mexico, Baja California, California, and Washington State. Why? Because we have the, uh, the mammal, uh, the the mammal protection law in the United States that also extend into Mexico and extend further up to Canada. So protection, and when we apply the protection, it's very helpful to, um, to support the, the existence of the animal and especially the big one. And that's where you see really how big is this animal. That's aerial photography, of course. The blow of the blue whale reach almost over 30 feet. 10 meters tall. Anybody knows what is that? It's beluga whales, what they call the canary of the sea. And what is that? What is that? There is no killer whale. There's no such things. 
This is how we use the language and how we are mystify things and how we create bad reputation to many of the animal because of lack of knowledge. Fear, the enemy of fear, number one is lack of knowledge. Orcas are actually dolphins, they are not even whales. They are tooth dolphins. The name killer whale had been adapted to the orca only because the Englishman that came to translate the manifest of the Spanish galleons of the 14th, 15th century um, could not give it any other name because the, the Spaniard and the Portuguese, when they wrote in the manifest, they're looking at an animal that actually killing other whales. So they call it killer whale, they did not give it the name yet orca. Only later on when we start to do research, when we start to develop university along the coast of Canada, uh, Washington, uh, Norway and other parts of the world, then we give them name. Today we know there are about five different species of orca in the wild. Two of them still unidentified in uh, Antarctica and the other three that we know of are resident, transient and nomad. And each one of them is different in the way which how they behave, which how the social, the social formation and how they feed. Those images are from Norway, where we see mostly, actually, um, um, trans um, not transient, we see resident orcas. Resident orcas feed mostly on fish, and there are a group of about 12 to 15 of them. But the, all, of, all, of the, all of the cetacean, the dolphin and, and whales, are actually led by females. And same thing with the orcas. And there is not even one, not even one accident ever happened in the wild between orca and mankind. The only time there was an accident, anybody knows where? Bravo. So let's close them. Because that's bad reputation unnecessarily. And they play without the need to have trainer and whistle and all kind of toy. They play freely in the wild. That was a moment of really unforgettable moment in the history, in my, in my, in my case, being in the wild for as long as I've been, and all of a sudden we had sunset in one hand, moonrise on the other hand, and the orca just passed in under the mountain in the front of the moon. In Norway. Anybody knows where Norway is? Of course, we have Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the beauty of the sunset together with the orcas. And anybody knows what is that? Well, humpback whales. Humpback Only 16,000 of them are today in wild out of them, half a million of them. How we know all those numbers, I don't know for sure, but I can tell you a quote from research and um, from um, all the environmental organization and the tech place, but especially after the curtain of, um, of the Soviet Union, we were able to get into the record of the Soviets, of the fin Finland, of the Norwegian, and the, the Iceland um, fishermen from the early part of the previous century, and then we'll be able to put all the number together, how many they have actually hunted, not just the number they gave at the time publicly, but get into the record, and only then find out really how many at least they have hunted, in addition to what we have today, the science and researcher came to approximate numbers, and that is the numbers I mentioned. Today, we have more accurate information about what, what left in the world, again, not, not specifically, but much more accurate in a 10 to 20 percent uh, margin of error, but we have about 16 to 20,000 compared to half a million, and this is a result for hunting, and today there is no reason for that whatsoever, although the Norwegian and the Icelandic and the Russian and the Japanese, original reason if they call it. We can swim with them, just like with the humpback, just like with the orcas, just like with the yeah, claws with the polar bear understanding, we can also actually snorkel. Actually, no scuba, no BC, no weight, just on our own air, be able to snorkel with them, because snorkeling is perhaps the best activity to meet the big animals, just like for us men, be gentle is the easiest way to get to any human if we want to. Nobody laughing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because big animals are most vulnerable when they are on the surface. They're on the surface because they need to breathe. And when they are, there's the only time where we can really match and get close to them. And the moment they get to the water, they took the breath and they went underwater. After the, the first five feet, there is no way for us humans ever to reach to get them because they are much faster, stronger than us. But when they are on the surface, 
and that's all a question of timing and coordination. That's why any of the expedition I lead, the photographic expedition for the animals, are with small group, with only four to six people only, to get the maximum result and the, abil the ability not to affect the animal and not to uh, really impose on them only two people at a time as we send to the water so the animal will be interacting with us, like in these images, or like with this image. This is a single. Among the whales, the humpback whale is the only one, the male, actually sing to attract the female to him. And in the water, as mentioned before, the water are three or 800 times denser than air. So let me ask you that. Where will be the best acoustic place in the world? Carnegie Hall, the opera house in Sydney, or underwater? Underwater. 360 degrees, 800 times denser, any vibration that this, that, uh, that this singer, humpback whale, will do, your heart will pump together with the music. It will be actually echoing in the vacuum or in the airspace that you have in your lungs. It's absolutely stunning. And mother and calf. Again, as I mentioned, it's all a question of timing to know an all animal, and you see that the pattern repeats itself, either among the orcas, among the polar bear, and among the humpback whale, is about feeding, about migrating, and about nurturing, knowing the right timing, be able to bring these kind of encounters between you and the animals. And the animals will come very close. In anybody, uh, we said that we have several photographers here. This is a very, very wide angle lens. Matter of fact, this is a fisheye lens. That means that I was less than one feet away from this juvenile um, uh, humpback whale that came and was very curious, what am I doing in the water? And that is a bridge. 40 ton of animal lift itself out of the water, and we don't know why. There is no reason that human can develop. And we said communication, uh, removing parasite. We really don't know why, but they can do it, and they do, they're doing it. <laughs> and that's the classic of the tale of the humpback whale dripping water in Alaska. We're moving right along for another creature of a lot of um, uh, excitement and colors, and those are the dolphins. There are about three dozen different species of dolphin in the wild, and those are, these are one in particular are, um, those are the bottlenose dolphin in Galapagos. This is the, the common dolphin, the Atlantic common dolphin in uh, South Africa. Of course, this is the bait ball where the dolphin are feeding on. And what is that? What's that? Go ahead, no, no, go ahead, it's good. What do you think is that? It is indeed a selfish. There are about seven, um, seven, there are seven species of what they call the billfish family. There are swordfish, there are uh, blue marlin, there are marlin, there are striped marlin, white marlin, selfish, and maybe one more that I forgot at the moment. However, there was, was any pictures of selfish until about four years ago. Anybody knows what happened four years ago? You see, blue planet, remember? was the first time they bought stories of the blue planet and the images of, the, of, the, of this uh, selfish. And I was the one that actually took them out there into Mexico to dive actually off just about 15 minutes of Cancun into the water of Isla Mujeres. If anybody been there uh, will know, it's a beautiful little island, um, very rustic it was at the time, but today it's becoming almost like a hub after Cancun because it became very popular among the fishermen and among the diver now everybody plunking out there. Yes. The fish is about nine feet long, and the bill is about one third of the whole fish. It is the fastest fish in the ocean. It clocked at over 75 miles per hour, faster than a cheetah on the land. It is fantastic. But the only time to catch those images, and the one that you see next, is when they're actually coming by... Uh, they're coming into Mexico, to this particular part of the water, in a, in a particular time of the year, in January, February, to feed on the Brazilian sardine. And here you see is the bait ball of the sardine. Nobody knew, and you know, a lot of fishermen going for many, many, many years, Hemingway and the rest, been catching those selfish and those marlin in Cuba, in Mexico, in Peru, everywhere else. But hardly anybody 
until four years ago, actually not hardly, is clearly nobody with a camera went to the water about four or five years ago. And five years ago when I went, I called the BBC, and when they did Blue Planet, they, called, they said, okay, put us together with the story, and we set up the setup. And that is the evidence. We're talking about baseball. Baseball happened many different parts of the world all the time, especially in remote island, in this case of Galapagos. Anybody been in Galapagos before? Besides Vivian? You? Have you been all the way in Darwin and Wolf? Then, no? Then most north, Northern Ireland. I don't know. You don't know. There is two islands up north of the equator about one mile called Darwin and Wolf. The middle of nowhere, 600 miles from any land and 100 miles north of Galapagos itself. They are part of Galapagos. And there are almost a million islands. There is no land. They need to feed. They need, they need food. And the food is in the water. So all of these seabirds. And when you watch well enough, you'll be able to see eventually the birds feeding and then the, uh, the tuna feeding underwater on a bait ball. And those are actually yellow-tailed tuna. The fish actually use its bill like the baseball bat used in a, in a baseball game. They actually hit the, uh, the fish with the bill. They move it like that all the time into the school. But only one selfish at a time. All the other selfish will wait till one finish, and then comes the second one. But it moving very, very, very fast. And just like this one. Anybody heard about the BBC Wildlife Competition of the Year, the photographer of the year? So about two, three years ago, this picture took the first place in the underwater photography. This was the moment, as again, very fast fish, very fast action, and to catch it when he took the, the bait, or to take the um, bait in its mouth, it was very, I was, I guess, very lucky uh, to be able to cap capture it and bring it alive. And this picture taken actually from the side of my shoulder. That's no, no manipulation and no photoshopping and nothing, any other, um, other elements, it's just the way it is, capture in camera at one time. And if everybody see the bait and you see the blood uh, that actually already, uh, the fish already bleeding between the two uh, parts of the bill. What is that? Great white, what does it do? <laughs> Breaching out of the water. It was very, un it was an, a situation that was up until uh, seven or eight years ago, Nobody knew, or if we knew about it, nobody reported or did anything about it. This actually happened only in South Africa. There are great white bridge also other places, but not to such an extraordinary behavior. The reason why exactly we don't know, but the, the purpose of the great white breaching is because they are looking after their actually seals that moving out from the island in early part of the morning. So in order to do that, after a year or two or three observing that, it become clear that a great white, just like all other predators, like all other masters of their ability, are very conservative animals, despite the power, despite the uniqueness ability that nature gave it to them. They are not a man-eater. They are not just anything they see. They are very methodical. There is an island just off, off uh, Cape Town called Seals Island, about 45 to 60,000 seals on it. Come, come January, um, they, they give birth, the, seal, the population give birth, the population rise to, about, to almost 60,000. The adult will have to go to sea to bring more fish for them, food. Around June, July, this is where the most migration of uh, big, um, the bigger seals go out to sea. The shark will arrive around Seal Island around May, June, and wait for the opportunity. Seals Island, it is relatively deep, go to the water, there is a, a, a steep cliff, goes to about 40, 60 feet before it reaches the bottom, and that's how it rises out of the surface. The great white patrol around it, especially in the early morning hours. And exactly like all surfer, when, when surfer go to, uh, to sea, early morning and late afternoon. When the shark operate, early morning, late afternoon. Why? The sun hardly rises over the horizon. The angle of the sun over the horizon is the angle of penetration into the water, the light. So the lesser 
the lesser the angle or the more angle, lesser, lesser activity. But a shark can see if there is a light on the surface, the, the shark on the surface. The seal cannot see the shark underwater because it's not enough light. Besides, the shark on the, on, the back, it's, on the back of it is dark, almost like the water, totally stealth. The shark will go straight up at 40 feet to accelerate and to catch the seal. The seal don't know what hit it. Come the light, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, the operation or the nature went to sleep until later on, 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening again. In order to be able to do that, we had to emulate the behavior of the seal, and we tore behind a dummy, a plastic or rubber dummy, about 20 feet away from the boat, and wait for the moment for the shark to jump out. And here you go. So three years ago, in the BBC competition, the first of the year, this also had the first place in animal behavior. And try to get very, very close to the animal and to bring really the behavior and be able to put almost, not almost, I put actually the camera was in the mouth of the shark and take it away and be able to bring the images back. Because understanding how the shark operates, and that's because of this understanding, I, next week, as Vivian knows, and hopefully she'll join me next year, when we go to Mexico and dive with a great white, there is one thing that all operators do continuously, including the, um, the discovery. We do the very unethical things. It is challenging the shark, actually teasing them and irritating them by putting blood and charm in the water, attract them to the camera. But if you don't put uh, charm or blood and not take it away from them, the shark will care less. And they will swim around me just like I'm a piece of uh, nothing in the water. And you don't believe me, am I right? Let's see. That's the animal that was captured our imagination. That's the animal that the media wanted to use so badly. That's the image, discovery of use, this exact image. In 93, they used it as a poster. They turn it vertical, they make it a poster, and all over the phone booths, buses, and uh, all over New York, uh, California, and uh, Texas, and um, Chicago to promote the Shark Week. But the truth of the matter is that we don't use blood because this is the prey. What you see here are the seals, but well, that's what they feed on. If we don't use charm and blood in the water, we can sit on the edge of comfort and against common sense. Because there is nothing to do with what we've been fed. We can swim openly, freely, safely with a great white. However, if we'll not be too bravado or too machos or imposing our superiority, perhaps superiority, over the wilderness. On the contrary, living with the, with the wilderness, like making love to nature, make love with nature, nature will be able to show us some most amazing moment just like this. And this is not, again, not touched and not expanded and not been blown. It is a 50 millimeter lens, especially. I, I use this lens in order to bring the image of the shark undistorted. All photographers know, and if you don't know, of any time you go to movies and you see anything, lenses have the ability actually to distort the images. There is depth of field, there is shallow depth of field, a lot of depth of field, and distort the images because of what they call the, the false perspective. But when you take a 50 millimeter lens, which is almost like exactly what we see in our own eyes, you'll be able to get these particular images. And that's a picture that one of my clients took of me swimming with a great white last year. Face to face as I'm closest to people on the front row. And that's the image I got in my camera. And I allowed the shark to come even closer toward me. There's another photographer. That's even close, half the distance between us two. And that's the image I got then. So if the movie created such, um, um, how do you call it, memories in our mind, I have to do, to try to do the same thing, but the opposite, remove this negative and be able to, under, be able to share with you the knowledge how this happened 
and how to avoid it or what to participate if you want to participate in something that has a positive effect on your own life, on the life of the animal and the life of nature. But not only to the great white. We can come even closer with this. Anybody know what is that? The whale shark. How big is the whale shark? Huge. How huge is huge? It's not as huge as Google. <laughs> but how huge is huge? It's about 40, 45 feet long. One of the three of four different species of shark that feed only on plankton and is the largest of all the shark species. So it does not have to eat meat in order to be large. You can eat plankton and you are the largest, which is bring another problem altogether. It is not necessarily the place right now, but the overfishing of plankton in the Southern Ocean in the around Antarctica by the country like the Soviet Union, China, and other, and they use that mostly for fertilization and food for their animals, animal stocks. That is becoming a problem because they are competing practically with the albatross, which are on decline, and of course with all the large whales, the blues, the sai, the, the fin whale, the humpback, and all of the, all of the other whales that actually go to the Antarctica to feed during the summertime, in Antarctica summertime, our winter time. And here is an example of the size of this mouth of this animal together with the diver just beside that he could swallow it very easily, but it does not really happen. We can imagine whatever we want to imagine. And of course, these stories and this stigma of this very prehistoric look like of the, of the hammerhead sharks out of Galapagos, when you see them in great numbers, sometimes hundreds together, but very un, um, unusual shape of the head and the eyes all together by, by the side, but they come very, very close to the reef and they are waiting for the, actually, for the butterfly fish to come and to clean them and the open mouth, like, just like we see it in a barber shop, in a barber shop, waiting for the opportunity to somebody come clean and give us a good time. Here you are. But that's the drama that you're looking for. That's the event, the phenomenal event that you're looking for. The schooling Amherd, sometimes 100 to 1,000. It could be three, five, sometimes up to seven, eight minutes parade of those school, and there are in the distance between me and the third, the second or the third row from here. All this. All this. Anybody knows what is that? Ray, what kind of ray? They are mobile rays. They are not mantas. They are mobile rays. They are smaller in size, and they feed also on plankton, and they move in a big crowd, in this case about 40 or 50 of them at one time, off the coast of Galapagos Island again. And this is the manta ray. This is the oceanic manta ray, or the giant manta ray, almost 20 feet from wingtip to wingtip. And this is... Not a selfish. What is that? Stripe marlin. It's striped, yes. It's a marlin. And there's a striped marlin about almost 12 feet, about 3 feet larger than a selfish. And again, the bill is about one third of the fish, the fish length. They are as fast as the selfish. And are, you can find them in exactly opposite side of uh, Mexico. If the selfish was found out in the Caribbean, the, the marlin will find out in, Atlant in the Pacific of Cabo San Lucas. And let's see how the marlin feed. The marlin feed a little bit different than, um, uh, than the selfish. And as you see, is the marlin here coming to the school. Actually, he uses bill like we use the chopsticks. Anybody knows how to eat chopsticks? You remove one sushi at a time, right? Look at the, fi um, the picture. is not very clear, unfortunately. But in, on, a, on the edge of the bill, you'll see one of the sardines. And then he took it. It's the last day of daylight of this um, sardine. <laughs> it is fun being in the water. It's joy. The water actually will carry you. As long as you just not not fight with it, just let the, let the water do what the water does and get along with it. The water will just carry you like being in the womb of the, of the mother. 70% and more of our planet is ocean. 
70% of the planet is giving us over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe on. And we polluted it galore. Anybody, probably, most of you heard about the plastic island that we have somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean all the way toward Japan. And all the pollution that we throw into the water factories from all over the country, including United States and all the other developing countries. We have to do something about it because there is no place as beautiful as look at these images. Look at this coloration. Look at the animal that's suffering, animal that we can relate to, that are our size, a turtle. We can relate to one to one. They are happy to be where they are. How can we continue to contaminate or really continue avoid playful with them? They are part of our playground. This is our, I showed you the, the, world of the, uh, the map of the world. That's my playground. I don't have to go to Yosemite only. The ocean, the rest of the world is our playground. And there are beautiful things out there to play with. Like those seals in the kelp of South Africa. Or the narwhal out in the high Arctic. Or the pink dolphin from the Amazon River. Even the anaconda. I know the movie creates such a drama and such a... is a piece of cake. Fortunately understanding that anaconda doesn't feed on the water. They feed on the land, but they don't feed on the water. And they will do nothing. We swim with them. 24 feet long. Animal. This is how we find some of the animals in the ocean. We cannot see into the water, but we can use the same understanding that the old generation had. We don't need sophistication and we don't need a Google Ocean to find out where are the selfish because Google Ocean doesn't know unless I tell them. <laughs> and that's what happened when you look from the surface into the water, half over, half under. The birds on top, the selfish on the bottom and between them are the bait ball or are the sardines. Going to Antarctica, we're not necessarily going to, we are not necessarily going to be like Titanic. It happened once in history. We learned the lessons. We dive under the ice, which is like diving in a palace. And we see these amazing vistas of the continent that's totally frozen. It goes through changes, like everything else, it goes through the changes. But we have the gear, we have the equipment, we are knowledgeable, and this exists. If you just reach out a little bit farther away from the normal life and be able to do those things, they're very unusual things, and to see these unusual places. Look how small we are on this planet that's called ocean. And this is the edge of the ice. And what we see under the ice, those jellyfish. That's how the old generation were looking and listening to whales and before they arrive into the crack in the ice. Those are the Inuit guys. And with those guys, we're working in the field on the edge of wilderness to be able to bring different kind of experiences rather than drive in the freeways of America or sitting in Starbucks. We're sitting on the edge of the ice in a tent for three weeks looking for polar bear or looking for the narwhal. And those are the guys we're able to tell us exactly because they don't have navigation, hardly even a satellite phone work from there. And the walruses. And the lonely walrus that went to die, and she moved away just like the Indian, uh, the American Indian, she will, leave the, she will leave the helm and go by herself into farther away in the ice and look the size of those tusks. She was probably about 11 or 12 years old, which is the maximum that walrus can live, and she went to die by herself away from everybody else. and mother and calf. On the edge of comfort, wilderness, and on the edge of noise, 250,000 of king penguin of the island of South Georgia. Un, sorry for my English, believable. Just my, staggering from the smell, 
from the noise and from the vistas all together. And the only one place on the planet you see something like that. And it's one of the most beautiful islands you will ever see. And that is the, you call it the, I would call it the grandiose, as the stand up, as we lower ourselves down, is about 30 inch, about 30 inch tall, 32 inches tall, lay myself down and look at the mountain behind, which is over almost 2,000 feet, and the penguin in front of us, they are the king. They are just give you a chance. That's a reason to live. That's a reason to breathe, to do something so fascinating. Who designed anything like that with those colors, with those wings, and able to swim in the water and to walk on the land all at the same time? Looking for predators, waiting to be eaten. <laughs> but there is a predator roaming around the ice and the only one of its kind. And we are all ready to catch its picture. We are all ready for the moment. And that's what, you know, anybody knows what is that? Leopard seals. The only predator that is in Antarctica. And actually, very interestingly, only during two months it feeds on penguins, on meat. On, meals, on, on meat. The rest of the time of the year, they feed on plankton. And look the size of the teeth, the canine teeth, and the grinding teeth that this animal got. Mother Nature is very, very um, unique. The animal looks like a prehistoric. It's a nine, feet, nine to 12 feet long. And it is powerful and it's fast. It's so agile. It's second that we've never seen anything like that. And very curious by us divers being together in the water with them. They are perfect hunter. But it's also perfect places for people like all of us. Clear, fresh water, and 300 foot visibility on more. The cenotes in Mexico. And of course, among the big animals, we cannot forget the gorillas out in Rwanda. Or the lion and the buffaloes in the Naguru Guru crater in uh, Tanzania. Anybody knows what is that? And what is this? What is this? This is the cheetah. And so what is that? Leopard. Right. Well, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> and I'm getting away from you guys. This is um, on the... Um, anybody knows Argentina? Peninsula Valdez? Anybody heard about Peninsula Valdez? A World Heritage Site is a, in actually a peninsula completely, un, completely close to, or stopped to be developed by the, world, by, the, by, the, um, by the World Heritage Foundation. And there are only one, for one particular reason, there are a group of orcas that still the only place in the world which they will come in and feed by stranding themselves on the beaches and take the seals out of the beach. And if you've seen the latest movies of uh, Disney, and there are some sections from this particular place when the orca come on the beach and take the animals away. Once in every two or three years, I run a special trip out there, and that's the edge of the place in Peninsula Valdez. And uh, one of the gauchos there had an Arabian horse, and since I'm an Israeli, he's the only one that let me ride on a horse. And with this, I guess, um, we're going just to... Got another native images from the island of Pala or the island of Yap in the Pacific. And let you know that all these images are taken actually in the natural setting, and all the animals depicted here are free and wild. None of them been fed, none of them been trained, none of them in captivity, all in the wilderness and all out there somewhere in the ocean that you can be able to see if you'll join me. If, you are, if you're interested in any of the trips, other photography or expeditions, or want to know more, one of the best places to find information is one of the best places, besides National Geographic or NOAA, is to find from on my website, biganimals.com. All right. Any questions? Yes. Uh, do you have trips that you can join? Yes, trip that you can join. This open, that's open to the public. That's the reason I ask you. If any of you, please. Before you leave, just fill me up the, this uh, card that I left with you. I'll be able to continue to be in touch with you. As today, as you know today, by the, uh, the med not the media, but the network or the server are not allow us to send mass mailing to people. 
unless people give us the permission to use and to send you an email. I cannot do that anymore. Otherwise, they will not let, if, they, if your email is not certified that I've received it from you, I cannot use it. So if you want to receive information, I'll be delighted to send you, but only through these cards. Any more questions? Yes. Have you ever been hurt? Only in my heart. <laughs> I was hurt once, and that is a result only of human error. I was hurt once by, actually, by walrus. When you operate with a walrus, you need to have, I need to have always a backup with me, somebody watching my back, because as you saw in the images, the walrus is mostly on an iceberg, but there are other walruses which are coming back home, and usually mother and calf, that's the season. So we got off the boat, I got first with my camera, and ready to go, and the safety, safety diver was supposed to come behind me. He did, and I did not pay attention, I'll continue moving, because when you are with a camera, you go to work, your safety diver is supposed to be behind you. He went to the water, but unfortunately, he lost his tank. The tank was fall off the, uh, of the carry, of the BC. So he was delayed getting to me. I did not know that. I'm looking at, the, I'm looking at um, to where the iceberg where the walruses were. And all of a sudden, I felt something strange. But you know, sometimes you have a six or seven cents or nine cents. The hair out in your back stand up and you know something is wrong. And I looked to my side and this female was very, very close toward me. And she had a cub with her. So she clearly going for me because she was very close with the task. If I will stay where I am, all this area will be the most sensitive area of humankind will be affected. I turned my butt and she, she nubbed me on my butt. <laughs> she made a hole in a dry suit and then I got flooded with water, but I put my air in my BC and she came again. But second time when she came again, I turned around and then we had a distance and I could raise my head with my, uh, my leg with my fin and it was a distance between us. She understood that I'm not after her. She continued went, and I took a picture, and she went home. <laughs> but that's the only time that really we got close to be hurt. It is, that's what I do. That's what people do when um, I have over 30 years of immaculate record, but managing risk. Well, as, you probably, as I mentioned to you before, I'm from Israel. I was an officer in the military about almost 12 years in the Special Forces, managing risk, it is what we do, what we learn to do. It doesn't make any difference. It's not necessarily be uniform. It's not necessarily to be guns. It's not necessarily, it is knowing, understanding what the risk you're facing and how to manage it and to avoid it. But how to reach the goal that you want to, despite this element, is knowledge is the enemy of all fear. And that's the key. The more knowledge, the more experience in the field. Every time pushing the envelope just one step. Bef don't let the envelope break because if you're blowing it too hard, it will break. Push it one step at a time and be able to see the result, measure it, and move again and retreat. If you need to retreat, it is a very proud thing to do. Retreat, it is not a defeat. A defeat is when you're not be able to stand here and share with you the experiences. Any more questions? Yes. It is about being a long time in the field, yes. Just being in the field. I did not learn it any other way. I did not have, sorry to say, or good to say, I did not have education. But the education was in a knock of, the real knock of life. I paid dearly for that. But again, thank for America for the ability. I borrowed the money. I was able to return, pay back. And that's what gave me the chance to learn, being in the field. And if you read the bio that Vivian put together, in any of the trip I ran as a businessman, I realized in order for me to gain anything, I had to have the leader of the world in their businesses, other marine biology, research, photography, to be co-host with me on the trip. I learned from them while I went along. Yes. You just said it. You just answered yourself the, very, very close to the subject. You cannot have, you cannot have powerful enough strobe to match the light from the, from the sun. When you work with wide-angle lens versus working with a macro, wide-angle lens means capturing a lot of space, you have to count on the ambient light. The strobe you bring in is only like a painter bring a brush over just to highlight several elements. 
you touch a very interesting point, and I'll take one more minute. I learned photography, not in photography classes, not in photography school, not from any photographer. I learned from the people which their, picture, which their prints or images sell for millions. Anybody can give me two names of, or three names of people that their picture or prints sell for millions? while I'm shooting. I don't take many. No, I don't take many because it is a mindset. Again, remember the painter I talked to you about? They knew what they're going to paint. Da Vinci, Angelo, Rembrandt, Monet, all of them, Van Gogh, Chagas, they knew what they're going to paint. They, they elaborate about their painting, about the colors and what they do until eventually they get what they want. I think the same because I start from a school of film, not from the school of digital. Digital can shoot 300, 800,000 images in one card. I started with a school of 36 frames. So I had to be very methodical in the way which how, what is the subject I want to choose, what I'm looking for. And the best photography in my view and, photogra and icon images are images that you saw 
before you photograph it or you thought you're going to see and what happened is mother nature in most time have actually outdid my own imagination and gave me a present bigger than any like the image of the uh, the image of the, the blue well on the back of the card you see the image of the blue well with the fin open is an image that I seen earlier in about 87, 87 or 88 in the National Geographic by Flip Nicklin. And it's an image of a fin, a fin well across, across the two pages with a beautiful sunset in, in Baja. I really wanted to have this image, or really, but as a good person, we don't copy, we emulate. We don't copy. So when I went eventually to Baja in the mid 90s and tried to get my own image, when the blue well was just in front of us, I had to make a decision, either I'm going to take the picture of the whole blue well, or half of it because it's so big the lens could not take it, or find something else. And all of a sudden, this blue well actually was resting on the surface. It allowed me to think for a moment and to be fast if I could, because that's the human element, and move toward the tail, which is much more uh, powerful rather than the whole body, which will be very long and not distinguished, but over the tail and look over the horizon and see the island. And that was a gift. It is not something that I could dream about. I was, in, I was impressed by the image that I've seen in 87, but Mother Nature at the moment, if I was not open to receive the information and given to me, I would not see it. I'll just do the same thing as other people did and move on. But at the moment you look at other opportunities, always look at other opportunities, just like Google does. Honestly, you guys, or whoever managing and running and driving you, they are just brilliant. Never heard about baseball. So that means that you have to join me. <laughs> because that's what I'm looking for. The baseball is where the action is. Most of diving trip, most trip, period, take people into places which is very usual and very common and they put you down to walk, either to see the Louvre, either to see the Eiffel, or either to see, jump to the water if you go diving, to see the reef, the coral reef, the, the clownfish and the, and the eels and so on and so forth. But they are not focusing, not willing to take the risk to see something which is not predictable. Baseball is not predictable. There is time and places around the world that could happen. That is where I put my effort. You'll have to look for an operator that is really looking for something like that to be able to give you the opportunity. Oh, why is the ball? Because the small fish, like people, when there is an explosion, they all run together, they hug each other for protection. So they all get together very, very tight. They hope they will not be taken by the, by the predators because they'll be in the center of the group. But the group is turning around. And everybody wants to be in the center. So is everybody in and out, in and out. And that's the bait ball. The bait because the bigger fish come feed on them. Then come the tuna, and then come the dolphin, and then come the sharks, and the birds from the top, and the photographer like us, come and take the picture. <laughs> Any more question? Yes. I love film. I grew up on film, but there's no film yet anymore, almost to be processed, especially slides, to be processed and to get the result. And digital today, really, uh, coming to an age of excellent and uh, delivering, uh, delivering quality. So it's a toss. It is just because I raise on film and the black and white and the color and we like some of the nuances that, that the film has, but the dynamic range of uh, digital reaching to the level of quality of what film did. So in the next year or two or three, we'll have digital perhaps even suppress uh, film and we have to deal with it. If you heard about HDR, yes? HDR putting some remarkable details in images that we could not do in film. So there is a, there is a positive progression and increasing value and increasing quality. Any more guys? I'm sorry? I used to carry more than one camera, yes. But in today, because of the digital, I, you don't need, you have 800, 1,000 frames you can shoot on those 32 gigabyte cards. You can do video at the same time. So it's one, one lens. In my kind of work, specialty on the big animals, so only one camera. When you go to, lo to work on the reef, it's a different story. Because when we work with big animals, we are in the open ocean. 
is wild, is wilderness. The encounter can be very short, like maybe 30 seconds, or can be even half an hour, but over, you have only one subject, one big subject to photograph. So only one lens will work well. But when you work on the reef, it's a different story. Because in the reef, you have other elements that you can photograph. Will be a seal, it will be sea fan, will be a sponges, will be the clownfish, will be um, the fish giving birth, or a uh, fish laying eggs. It's different, uh, different cameras you want to carry with you. And also, when you are working on a reef, you're in the shallow water, 30, 40, 60 feet. You can stay much longer, hour, hour and a half, two hours, if you are on nitrix, without problem. And then give you, but you want to have more cameras, even digital. Yes. It's all, it's all in the line of work. It's like everything else. You have a computer, and you have a, a handheld, and you have the iPad, and the whatever. The same thing in, a, in a photography. It's only tools to do the job. And nobody the job you want to do. Or if you have fun and you, want, you have a particular vision, how to capture the vision, bring it alive. Thank you very much. Or oh, any more question? Who is coming on a trip to uh, this weekend? <laughs> We're going to do a great white swimming in, out of the cage. All right. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>